How are you doing? Okay. Good, good. Okay. You just want to say something? Uh, <laughs> we'll just go ahead and get started. This is Congressman Estes, and what we kind of had planned was for Tony Delp was in, in on the starting of the pizza place, and he's going to talk a little bit about how that started and involved the high school here. And then I think the other issue we want to talk about a little bit is water. We had a meeting last night and I'd like to talk about that a little bit. And then we're planning on checking the grocery store out and the feedlot. So uh, I guess, Tony, you want to just start off? Sure. Uh, we started with the school. We had a class that uh, started up with a business plan and uh, we were wanting to work with them to be able to give them some education firsthand on starting a business. So they worked through a business plan, actually applied for operating notes, and uh, went through the process of getting things kind of started and up and running, and uh, different uh, projections as far as cash flow and so forth. We had an uh, individual that uh, contributed some money to us to redo the, the building here, and uh, we put in new equipment, and uh, we've got it set up to work we can accrue uh, some income to kind of keep things up to date and going and hoping to continue with the school on some projects where they can be involved and learn uh, not just starting a business but what it takes to keep a business going and running so yeah. so it's been a good project we had uh, it wasn't a very large class we had about five students that uh, that worked with us but i think we hire maybe oh in the neighborhood of six or eight individuals that uh, that are uh, young adults that work here now. And, uh, and in working with them, we've tried to kind of show them what uh, a local business does for the community. For instance, our business isn't that large. We hope to be between 200 and 250,000 in sales through the year. But through that, we'll generate uh, probably $4,000 that'll go back into the county uh, to help support our grocery store that we're building and also to support the county. We put another about 80000 into the, the community as far as salaries and wages and uh, that. And of course, just the operating uh, and uh, working with other vendors in the community, well, uh, we put more money back into that. And so, so it, it kind of shows uh, the kids that uh, having a local business really makes a difference in the community. The other thing that's been interesting for them is the fact that uh, we end up having to charge more than Pizza Hut does or whatever, but uh, when you get down to the bottom line, our net on sales will run anywhere from 25 to 5%. So you <coughs> have to manage some things as far as uh, labor and cost of goods in order to just even make a profit and make things work. So, so I think it's been a good education for them. It's in conjunction with our uh, museum. Uh, uh, we've done a timeline here with then we'll kind of rotate those pictures over the over the year to kind of show things and have some displays here that uh, that are from the museum actually a Hall museum who uh, was started by Lucille Hall uh, she was a fourth grade teacher uh, here and very interested in education and so uh, we've tied this in with the, the museum to kind of uh, continue to promote education yeah. and do that so yeah. So it's been a good project. And, and, uh, a couple of our board members are here. I don't know if you have anything you guys want to add to it. Mitch Minnis and Jim Ronan. Uh, been a very positive experience for not only us on the board, but also the community. It's neat to see something going downtown. Yep. Proud to be a part of it. When Dillon's closed, you could take a shotgun and shoot any way through St. John and you wouldn't hit anybody. <laughs> And just this little activity on this corner. I walked out one day and looked out the window and there was cars. There was actually people. Yeah. So it makes a difference. Yep. It's a good difference. It does have a little bit of activity just to get that boost. Yep. Get that boost going. So when you talk about the board, is that is it part of the chamber, part of the economic development, we, or is it we, uh, just for this? Or? We set up a nonprofit 501c3. We're still applying for the 501c3, yeah. uh, but the whole museum is also a 501c3, and so we have a separate entity. Then we involved uh, some uh, other business people in the community on that board to kind of help give guidance. 
Yeah. Josh Myers, our superintendent, and he's uh, been working with us too with the students and different projects that we've done too. So, yeah. so is it the 501 C3 is just for this? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really St. John Hudson Community Enrichment Foundation. We could do other things, but at this point in time, really the, the focus is on the education with the students and yeah. working with the, the pizza area. Yeah. But we could broaden if we wanted to, but right now I don't think there's that desire until we get things going a little better. <laughs> yeah, get, get something moving, really steady state, right. and then uh, yeah. uh, grow from there. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's kind of neat. It's such a great learning experience for, for the students to go through that process and actually just see, see it work. So, so many times it's so easy to, well, yeah, that business can take care of that or they can pay more or whatever else. And There's really a lot in business that can apply to your individual life, too. Yep. It's yep. basically knowing where the money's going, where it's coming from, and yeah. making things work. So you might yeah. tell them about the project that the kids did about you know, Pizza Hut has always got really low prices. That's not the whole story, but they've got a price on something. And the kids did a project because our prices were higher. You might tell me how they came out on that. Well, I thought it was interesting. They were looking at if, if you drive someplace to eat, you know, there's some costs there that you don't uh, take into account. It may yeah. be cheap, cheaper than the other location for the food. But, uh, but Overall, you're probably not saving unless you're going there anyway. But, right. But again, I think for me, the biggest thing is what it returns to the community through education, taxes, salaries, etc. There's some huge things there that really benefit the community. So. And just just the livelihood of the community, yep. like you said, in terms of having people down. And the one thing they haven't mentioned, we've got a really good product. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we timed this wrong. Yes. So that's that's kind of neat to see things like this happening, and, and uh, you know, I well, first of all, I wanted to say apologize for being late. We had a stop in uh, Hutchinson earlier this morning, and just didn't get get out of there fast enough and drive fast enough, and got behind a truck on the way. And, didn't see enough of passing lanes on highway 10, you know. All of those, all of those little things you run into. But uh, I appreciate the opportunity to just come out and talk about some of the things that are going on. There's uh, just so many things when we come back here, each of the, the stops, whether it's the, the flour mill or now seeing the grocery store come to life after uh, uh, some of the things that uh, getting the grants pushed through and, and uh, helping make, make that happen. <laughs> Every time we drive around and see a white, uh, out now when we're out and about. We were talking about it last week. We were, we were driving out towards Pratt and and, uh, and past one. So it's actually a, a great thing for helping the hometown. And <clears throat> one of the things we've got to figure out more of, and I know I know you do a lot here of, of trying to set up the incubator and the entrepreneurial process and figure out how to make that work. And that's, we've got to do more of that. Just to get that economic development across the state, and that's an issue we have. Is whether it's jobs and businesses, or whether it's housing. And uh, we were we were at a couple of places, even even in Wichita and Valley Center, having troubles with housing, having affordable housing for folks. And uh, so we were at a couple of places yesterday, working through that. So, uh, but it's uh, it's it's great to see a, uh, an adventure like this, or. A, an organization that's working like this. So I could talk a lot about what's going on in Washington, or you know, you, you mentioned that uh, you can learn a lot in life from business. And I um, actually, Washington needs to take some. The federal government needs to take some common sense lessons too. A, I, I always point to our spending process. Is you know, all of us when we think about our personal budget or we think about the businesses, you, you build a budget and then you track your expenses against that. Well, at the federal government, we don't do a one-step process. It, we have to make it three steps. And uh, First is a, authorize a program, and then you go build a 10-year budget and, and vote for that, pass that out with, with budget spending. And then you set that on the shelf, and then you come back and say, okay, now we want to do the, 
the spending appropriations process and coming back to that and technically we, we um, tie our appropriations process to spending equal to or less than what the budget was but there's really no driver to, to match back to the budget it's it's a, it's they're all standalone efforts and so we we uh, we need to simplify a whole lot of things at the federal level uh, just the bureaucracy is so big uh, to, to focus on for things like that. Speaking of big, you can just chew on this the rest of your trip. I heard a report on the news the other day. The CIA fellow that escapes in my mind now that just lost his credentials for... And they said there was 5.2 million people in the United States that had clearance of one kind or another. And every five years, I remember these figures, and you can figure mm -hmm. 5.2, and it cost $25,000 every five years to renew these people so they've got their clearance. Number one, why do they need clearance? Yep. Number two, when you go through that, you're going to say, Where's the money coming from? No. Yep. It's not in the billions, it's in the trillions. Yep. I want to know why. Why Why does anybody need clearance after they're not? Particularly after they're out of the role that they right. got it for. I mean, and I don't know how many people, were, were those five million active today or those five no. million that were out of no, the position? No, that's 5.2 million total is what I understood. Yeah. So, you know, that'd be a million a year that have to be renewed if you're doing a five-year cycle. And if it costs $25,000 per person, that means it's uh, $25 billion each year yeah, but it gets to, worse to renew that. those. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, what yeah, need, I think... What you need in Washington, D.C. is some entrepreneurs. <laughs> now, get rid of the, the government. <laughs> well... Excuse me. What we really need is to go back to the way the government was supposed to be. That's right. Which was limited, which was fewer things. And what we've done over time is we put in place all these programs. So many of them are automatic. So many of them are, uh, they just happen. And maybe it made sense 20 years ago, or maybe it marginally made sense 20 years ago. They don't make sense today. But because our government was designed to not put many laws in place, you also can't end laws that are in place. So I, I'm a big advocate that we put sunset provisions on every program, every agency, every five years, every seven years, and come back and review it. Maybe it makes sense to renew it, keep going. Maybe it makes sense to kill it. Maybe it makes sense to modify it, but keep it going. Well, that's a great segue into one of the issues that's really affecting the outlook of Stafford County right now, which is the way that we manage Quivira National Wildlife Refuge. I don't, we have some people in the room here who can speak much more in depth to that than, than I can, but the way that they are proposing that we, and really they have the authority to push that we manage our irrigation here is a great example of, uh, you know, the federal government doesn't have the same ever oversight that the rest of us do. Yep, yep. So what, what happened last night, or what's the latest? I don't... <clears throat> <laughs> you and I visited about this issue. Yep. We give you the tour. Here. I, yep. uh, this is Kent Lamb. He's one of the GMB board members. He's been in the thick of this since the mid '90s, early '90s. Before that. Is that long? <laughs> Before that. Before really? I, I'd like. I'd like to segue to him for the moment. Yeah. Okay. I think there's several focuses and a lot of our issue but problem with doing this is they're trying to use a vehicle that's supposed to be voluntary to solve an, uh, an impairment which is not non-voluntary and uh, very binding and uh, chief engineer is doing that which you'd be familiar with the agencies in the past uh, probably one of the things that would help us most not going into, into details of and opinions is uh, we're, we're, we're unusual in that this problem 
can really be solved with augmentation. In other words, bringing water available to the surface water right, right over, which is Covera, the National Wild, uh, Wild, uh, the Department of Interior. One of the big helps to us is we, we've made two offers to them, both of them for augmentation at specific sites on the refuge where they want to. See, this is 2,200 acres, 22,000 acres big place and you start running water in there it runs all over the place a lot of disappears and doesn't there's no beneficial use to it yep. but yet you still have to count for it you have to provide it okay we we went we tried to give them a smaller map at specific locations and they came back and said there are going to be no wells and there's going to be no pipelines or anything else but if you go up there they have some low lines they have other lines but and they've also found that other refuges throughout the nation have wells augmentation wells Seldom is there water available on site to meet their needs. If they're an individual, the chief engineer cited a case in Stevens County. These were ground water users. You had an impairment. One guy was impairing another. One, one well was impairing another. Different ownership. And uh, one of the uh, rulings on it was the first guy that filed the impairment against the other guy, they told him lower his point of diversion. So he did. Goots Mills, in case you happen to know the case, about 20 years ago. Mr. Mills, the one that caused the trouble, he didn't have to pay for him to lower his point of diversion. Now that's a many, many of what we could do. We're not even saying the water's there and usable on refuge. Uh, we've even cigar said we'll pay the we'll pay the price of bringing it to the service for your use. Now it's tip technically lose it, lowering their point of diversion. And uh, they said no. Uh, we, we, federal law bans use of uh, having wells on refuge. Federal, uh, we're trying to get rid of all line, pipelines of any kind. These would just be water lines, what they'd be. And uh, uh, so they said, you can do it, but you're going to have to go off refuge on the private land and work through that process, which is going to be very expensive and very uh, tedious to say the least and uh, and the, the thing is that's a salt water marsh which means it has kind of, you've been there site high concentrations of, the water over there in that area can be utilized for augmentation and not be really really useful to any other purpose mm -hmm. and so it doesn't make much sense to come over this way probably and uh, take good fresh water contaminate it and then the other side of it is the Corps of Engineers held out since clear back in the early 50s that the rattlesnake dumps 200 tons of salt a day into the park, Kansas River. And at one time they were going to put a, some dams in, a dam just to, just north of St. John, then then, a, then Bryan dams over in there to stop the flow of it. But here we are. They turned after after they decided it wasn't cost effective. Yeah, in the mid 50s, then they turned right around and fire, filed for a water permit, and uh, it took uh, 30 years to perfect it. And uh, all the irrigation was developed in the meantime. So, really, we could the thing that we could get out of it mostly is if we could come top down to Denver and uh, look, put, look, put a little persuasion on them. I would start using the word pressure, persuasion might be a better word to allow that to happen uh, I think that we can find funding to do it uh, either locally or beyond but uh, in other words it wouldn't be a budget budgetary constraint to, to them or a liability uh, yeah, I think it can be done but right now uh, we're kind of looking for some help on the Washington side to come to the Department of Interior to allow this to happen and it would be <coughs> Third, you work fast, efficient. Everything is good in doing it. In that, your it's their property. They'll be entitled to use the water as they please. We'll provide the the, uh, the mechanics of doing it and uh, the cost of operation, probably, which is a I wish they had that for irrigators too. Uh, same program. Somebody else pick up the tab. But, uh, I think it could cut the cost. I think it's likely it could cost. It could cut the uh, cost of the project and a third maybe we don't know because they, they, it's just a deal because you're getting easements right of ways some aren't going to sell 
So I'm not going to lie. So you're going to condemn it? Uh, I'm not a condemner. So uh, I, don't, I don't know how you're going to work around through that. And uh, you're talking about 5,000 acre feet of water, which is quite a bit of water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quite a bit of water. And yep. uh, we'd, like, we'd like to see some help from you and uh, our senators. Uh, Whatever, whatever your your possibilities are, contacts and uh, one one of the things that and I, I got a couple questions for you when we get back to, but one of the things I've seen is that fish and wildlife is probably slower to respond to hey, there's a new a new climate in Washington. Um, that you know the expectation of the federal government is that uh, we work more with with uh, citizens and constituents as opposed to uh, imposing a lot of mandates from Washington. And I think part of that's happened because uh, Secretary Zinke's wanting to do a major reorganization of, of the interior and um, that that slowed down a little bit. Each one of the departments uh, being addressed with some of their issues. Uh, so. And, I need to circle back and see what the status is with him on that. <clears throat> but my, my question is more centered around where, what's what's the the plan that we can go uh, advocate and be a persuasion uh, for? Is is that the, the drilling of the, of the wells on the? On the I, on I the think ground? so. That access yeah. uh, for efficiency and availability yeah. and uh, and the water is just there. I don't think an exaggeration say they're sitting on the work on the ocean, literally, yeah. and it's solving, and uh, it's, it's really available. It's just a case, and you're not going to go very deep. Deeper you go, the higher concentration. And they worked already with KDEG if they had these well fields. Uh, I think that, I think at 3,000 3, parts is what uh, is what they put the limit on it. But uh, if you're on if you're on site though, uh, you aren't putting anything into the creek. See, they want it pumped into the creek, and then run into the yeah. refuge. Which, which and every every time every time it moves, it's kind of like yeah. uh, tax dollars. Every time it's passed around, it becomes less and yeah. less. It didn't, it didn't make any sense. I mean, no. it didn't seem to make sense to me to pump it out of the ground, miles away, and run it not run it through a pipeline yeah. in the creek, but run it through the creek. Which, like you said, when you have all the issues with whatever evaporation or or uh, uh, loss along the way. Our first two estimates, the first one was 2,500 acre feet of water, which delivered site could be a lot of water, and I think it would really meet their needs. Uh, the modeler first came out, first crack out of the box, put the, put the number 1,700 acre feet. And then it keep getting moved up as you moved away from the stream. It got up to five, and now then they're talking as possibly could go as high as 6,900 or maybe 10,000 acre feet on 10, basically the use is about 10,000 acre feet. In other words, that stream still has flow in here. Yep. The expectations are that uh, yep. the county's going to pay for the whole thing. Well, there's, there's three other studies out there for augmentation, and I think they're all below 2,000 acre feet. The chief engineer is the one that's come in with the high number. A couple other things we need to keep in mind here is KDA study uh, shows this area's sustainability is 250 years in Stafford County. Uh, the surrounding area of GMD. Uh, has some decline level, levels, but not serious. KGS study in March of this year come out and said that GMD-5 is within 2% of sustainability, and their definition of sustainability is 250 years plus. Probably the big thing that seems to get lost in all of this is Covera National Wildlife Refuge. It has a prestigious sound to it. It's something that you think it's been there forever. They got to file their permit in 57. They started this project in 54. They didn't complete it until 1987. That's less than 40 years old. It's man made. Mm -hmm. The Rattlesnake Creek was diverted into the Little Salt Marsh by a hunting club. The Little Salt Marsh has been filled since then. Everything between the Little Salt Marsh and the Big Salt Marsh is diversion works created since the 70s into the 80s. It's all man made. And I think, and I think let's finish the project, yeah. put the water on there where they can maximize the refuge. Uh, they have a water manager that, when he was first approached with this two and a half years ago, he thought it sounded fantastic. Yeah. 
I just think politically it also just gets blurred with what the discussion is about the Ogallala Aquifer. And this is not talking about water conservation. When we're curtailing in irrigation in this context, we're not conserving water, we're just diverting it to a different use. And that's completely different than what they're talking about in the context of the Ogallala Aquifer. I think that gets lost a lot of the time too. I think the real heartburn comes from folks that uh, they look at the refuge and they're short staffed. There's invasive weed species, there's some things there that on the outside view most of us would manage differently. And the fact that in this general area right through St. John they're going to take 4,000 acre feet. So that equivalents to about 25 pivots. Probably an average family farm might have five pivots, that's five families. That their lifestyle changes. In Washington DC numbers that's not big. In our numbers that's huge. It affects Josh at school five or ten less students, that's huge. It affects that my boys may want to come back farm someday and they've watched all this entrepreneurial stuff take place in this community. But yet, we have a refuge and management doesn't live within the county. They don't have a tax base that supports the county. And we're going to decrease their tax base with this move. And so that's what gives a lot of people a lot of heartburn. It's not the word against ducks and geese and people who enjoy that. It's what it's going to do to our community and what it will change down the road. And so we all look, we've all had to get better as irrigators ourselves and put in drip lines or different nozzling systems, everything to improve efficiency. And we look over there and we don't see the efficiency increases or availability to do that increase in efficiency. And we believe that this augmentation field is an excellent opportunity to that. If we can put 1,500 acre feet in there instead of 4,000 and do the same thing that they need to do and bring the ducks and geese that the people want to see, right. I think we can meet both ends there. If we can, but common sense doesn't always. Okay. Yeah, it's not always but, okay, so to the point, I mean, I guess that's the idea that we don't feel like that the, the, the Department of Interior is coming to the table with the same willingness to find a, a solution. And if we can get some political pressure to achieve that, that would be helpful. Yeah. It, what, what is their goal? Is their goal the best refuge they can have, the best managed refuge they can have? What is their goal? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what their goal is. I mean, some, unfortunately, sometimes in the bureaucracies you run into, well, this looks good on paper, so we wrote it up as a report, so that's what we're going to work for without looking at the realities of what's happening in the real world and in that aspect. So, uh, you know, when we were here before we did the tour, uh, I mean, like you said, there's a lot of work that can be done in terms of managing that. I mean, there's, there's some minor cap. Minor, in Washington speak, minor capital issues that they, I thought they needed to take care of, you know, in terms of, of the dams and, and uh, the locks that they've got going through between the, uh, the different areas there. I, I think, you know, one of the things that when we left before, well, I guess one of the things I looked at too was the, the, uh, the little salt, salt marsh. They may have been managing it great for a wildlife refuge, but poor for managing the water. Because, you know, having such a shallow marsh at the beginning, which is really your feeder, I mean, that, that's the place you want to make it deeper. I mean, this is me thinking like an engineer, so that you collect the water when it rains and have it there to use throughout the, the, the drier times. And uh, of course, that's not the perfect way if you look at that as part of the wildlife thing. So, let us get let's get back and get the latest great I mean the, when we left before it was uh, I mean there were still some meetings to be scheduled and things and I I don't know what all happened um, you know with the discussion last night of where where all that is but uh, I, it I'll, hasn't moved very far <laughs> it hasn't moved far yeah um, because they're waiting for us to say yes to their way of doing things yeah. and so, so it's so a muscle there. deal they're working on a compromise, but it's you compromise yeah, to their yeah, position. Right. Um, that's what it sounds like. Well, the big hang-up's the mem memorandum for the augmentation project is part of it. Well, it's hard to get any document out of those agencies. We won't name which one it is. It's hard. It's you've seen it. You're in Topeka. It takes forever to get a, an approval on a project of any kind coming out of there. Just to change and or change the use of something like this, it may take two years to get it. Yeah. Yep. They, they say it's better than that, but sometimes it takes less than that. Uh, but uh, it, it's a very slow process, and uh, I think I think locally, not speaking on behalf of he was there last night, but I really did visit with him. But their management team there is limited, 
they also would be very appreciative of this water you know that in specific times in specific quantities it, so they aren't resistant I think the resistance is out of Denver mm -hmm. and I think there could be a lot of politics in it mm -hmm. uh, from and politics not Republican Democrat politics but uh, the uh, wildlife uh, environmental people that uh, are pretty can be can be rather uh, uncompromising yeah. Nature Conservancy has taken a little interest in that. They've kind of had a change of focus, and uh, they're looking more at projects like this rather than going in and buying land and giving it to the state of Kansas to enlarge shine bottom, which is actually too big. You could say the same thing about Covert, but it's what it is. Uh, it's probably too big. It'd be easier to manage if it wasn't because it's not gone big. Mm -hmm. you know, it, uh, mm -hmm. they're trying to, it's kind of like a guy going out there with a, going to farm 100 quarters with a four tractor that only has a single bottom plow on it. It, it's it's a it's a, it's unmanageable. But, yep. uh, the locals, but it seems to be everything. Uh, in terms of how fast that goes, the first offer of the 2,500 gallon or 2,500 acre feet on the refuge. I think we waited uh, four months to get our no. And the question was uh, how high, where did it go to get that no? And the answer was it's none of your business. So uh, it's short. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. It wasn't quite that. We, just, we didn't know whether it went to the Washington, D.C., up the line, through mm -hmm. all agencies or what, but it's, it, it took, took the DWR three years to even say there was an impairment figured out. Yeah. And uh, so uh, now they want it done in six weeks. So uh, they wanted it done last year and the year before, too. They wanted it done immediately after they, they, they found their findings. And so, and see, we've only got a little over a year on that, so it took three years to but uh, I think they're getting, even, even DWR is getting a lot of pressure from some of the environment. The Audubon Society in particular has been uh, threatened to sue, so. Okay, well, who, who's good for us? I mean, Debbie Looper here is my district director in the office, and, you know, uh, she was here, and we had a couple other uh, folks from the office over here went through the tour with me back here, what, three months ago? Um, one of the things at that point in time that was kind of we were waiting on hearing back for some things and, and uh, Farm Bureau was working on working to some of it too um, so I just want to get want to get the greatest the, the latest update so that we can then go put uh, work some persuasion I mean, a lot of what we end up doing a lot of what Debbie's role is is reaching out to agencies to talk about why is this problem happening and how do we fix it? And um, it's a it's a sad thing, but it sometimes is their very effective way in terms of the con congressional office calling to ask what's going on with whether it's a visa, whether it's you know groundwater issue, whether it's a VA issue. Um, so I think it's uh, we need to get we need to get engaged. And I don't know where they where they are on their thought process of the timeline, but they the bureaucracy. Um, the, uh, the, the problem that we're seeing a lot now is that <clears throat> because the Senate is slow, so slow in approving the president's appointees, you know, was it, as of a month ago, they did a calculation that it was nine years before all his appointees could be confirmed to the Senate at the rate they were going. Um, and it's that, that mid-level that the deputy director and assistant um, secretary that they don't have confirmed yet, and those are the folks that actually provide the oversight of all the career employees. You know, Ron, that's what's so maddening. We sit out here, we see what's going on, we know what's going yeah. on, and they don't really care. Yeah. If it takes them nine years, it takes them nine years. Yeah. You know, you go to this irrigation thing, I don't know what the worst case scenario is, but if they would cut the water 50%, we're done. Yeah. We're all done. Yeah. And speaking as a banker, your, your balance sheet goes down, you got a problem with all your lending. I mean, it just shifts everything. Yep. 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 And they don't have the foggiest idea about that. It's because over and over again, too many times the bureaucracy, because it's gotten so big that the majority of the people there spend their time dealing with the person sitting next to them. 
and they don't deal with real people in the real world. And so they focus on how is it easy for me to communicate to Sally next to me as opposed to communicate with the person who's really working the issue, living on the land, uh, and trying, trying to, to resolve that. And, uh, you know, you kind of touched on about losing five students, but also lose the tax base of the land if you go for it and shut those students down. Which ties into one of the tax base that supports it plus the, the income to pay back the, the funding from the bank. We've got a new pizza place, we've got a new grocery store, we've got other things. And, you know, I'm kind of a new person on this uh, Rattlesnake Basin deal. This has been going on 30, 40 years, and they just ran a new model that came out in last August. And, they increased the basin size. So now since August, I'm in the Rattlesnake Basin. And so now they're talking before the end of the year, they're wanting to cut you know, our water rights, which Brian was talking about the high impact area, they're wanting to take 4,000 acre feet. My farm is eight and a half miles away from the Rattlesnake, and they're talking about cutting my water 23%. Uh, the numbers that they're, and I have an old water right, uh, you know, this impairment, from what I've understood, is they say we're impairing 5,000 acre feet of water. Uh, when they're wanting to cut all the water permits around, uh, that's 210,000 acre feet of water they're wanting to take out to cover 5,000 acre feet. When this augmentation would cover it, you know, they're wanting to cut big water rights down to 145 acre or 146 acre feet per circle. You could raise corn this year, but this is a wet year. On a normal year, you can't raise a corn crop. And they're talking about 1,900 wells. I mean, that's a lot of, lot of devastation for this community. It just does, it doesn't make sense. The solution for the problem, that's the real problem. And that, that's the issue that we've got to go address is what's, uh, what's that. So uh, let's, let's get on and let's see what we, uh, let's get the latest update from there. Then we'll start making some calls and working with the department here and start, start at that direction. Another thing you touched on there, not to change horses here, but uh, you mentioned visas. And I guess from an agricultural industry, what we see, uh, a community that's got a lot of Spanish folks in it, it's, uh, which are important members of our community, is getting this immigration problem uh, fixed. That people have been here illegal in a common sense kind of way. Um, H-2A worker program is pretty valuable to agriculture businesses in our area, and maybe expanding that to year-round help. And I'm not 100% sure what the H-2C program is got in, but I think that starts to address it. Because that's one of the things that we're concerned about, where the labor force is coming from, and what available the laborers are. And, you know, Iowa highlighted last week a problem, and that was a very unfortunate situation. That brings the forefront again. There's some underlying problems that got to be fixed in this system. Yeah, there's so many things broken in the immigration system and the process. Not just the folks who came in illegally, but also the folks that try and go through the legal process, whether they're trying to become citizen or just go through the work, you know, work permitting process. Um, we, tr we tried, the Senate tried earlier this year, the House tried. Uh, unfortunately, I think in both cases, particularly the House side, got caught up in the election year politics uh, of not being able to pass a bill because it was easier for some people to campaign on this huge problem as opposed to working to solve the problem for people. And, you know, the, the bills that came up, you know, one of them I, I voted for and one of them I didn't because of the way the wording was structured. But, you know, if the H2C new category would be to, to allow 18 months uh, for somebody here, which, which was intended to address if you're running a dairy, if you're running a ranch, if you're running a feedlot, you need somebody here full time. If you're picking strawberries in California or lettuce, you, you're there for the season. And, and so having that longer period of time allows folks to work whichever uh, farming environment they're in. And, and so that's the that's the piece that we, we've got to get back to. We've got, we've got to address the work visa issues at the least. We've got to address uh, legal residency for some of those issues. Uh, we've got to address border security so that we know who's here and who's not. And that's at the border, but it's also 
having the folks tracking visas because the majority of the people that are here illegally now came here legally, either on a, a school visa, on a temporary work visa, on a uh, you know just a visitor, a pleasure trip, and just overstayed their visa uh, for for whatever reason. And so we've got to get back to solve that. Unfortunately, I don't. I don't hold a lot of confidence that we'll get it done before the November election. Uh, we've got we'll be we'll be there three weeks in uh, three weeks in September, and then two weeks in October is what we're scheduled to be uh, now, um, and then uh, back after the election. So uh, it's something that we can see. We've got to, we've got several things we've got to do. We've got to get the farm bill done. We've got to get uh, appropriations for 2019. We've got to address the. FAA reauthorization, all of them before September 30th. So, are there proposals that you feel good about that are actually crafted that just don't stand the likelihood of passage I, in this environment, or do you think that I really, the right solutions are even being offered? I really like the good lap bill that was brought up. That was that that first bill that the House voted on, uh, and not just as it was originally introduced, but as it was added to because there are some things being added to address more of the H2C issues. And, uh, but it, but it, addressed, it addressed border security, which I mean, that includes more, more border patrol agents. It includes some funding for a wall or a fence in some places that made sense. And that, that's the political hot button right now. Uh, I mean, we don't want a wall. We don't want the Berlin Wall in the United States. And, uh, but there's places where it makes sense and between Southern California and Mexico where there's houses on either side of the border and uh, you know having some some barrier uh, some sort of, uh, it doesn't make sense in the uh, rural uh, hills uh, in Arizona and Texas that uh, that'd be a silly solution um, provides legal residency for the, the DACA the people that came here as the DACA categories and would allow them to apply for citizenship, but they have to get in line and follow the same process everybody else did. Didn't give them a special path. Uh, and change that extended chain migration, which, you know, we have, the intent was for when somebody becomes a citizen, they can bring in their family. And conceptually, that's your spouse and your, your minor children. Well, the way the law is today is, when you become a citizen, you can bring in your spouse, you can bring in your minor children, you can bring in all of your adult children, your brothers, your sisters, your parents. All of those come in on your citizenship. And so what we're saying is, let's let's pare that down to the core family of the individual, their spouse, and their minor children, and all the other adults in their family can apply for citizenship on their own record and go through that as, as adults. Um, and then it ended the, a smaller program uh, the visa lottery program, which basically was just quotas for each country had some quotas. Um, and what the, the whole intent there was to free up more slots that then could be used for work merit type categories, uh, whether they're in agriculture, whether they're in, in technology, whether they're in other areas. But not in the, not reduce the number of people that migrate in, but uh, instead of having uh, all these extra people that get in on a quota or people that get in as uh, uh, extended family members that uh, you come in more on a, on a merit or work okay. So we're going to go back and continue to figure out ways that we can maybe craft part of those, some of those pieces uh, to keep that moving forward. Um, it's, it's, it's just, the, the thing that's frustrating, one of the things that's frustrating to me that I've, since I've been up there is that if we don't have to make a decision today, we'll put it off to tomorrow, until next week, till next month, till next year, uh, which is it's just a horrible way to, you can't solve small problems because they didn't stack up in the big So do they really care in Washington what happens out here? Seriously. <clears throat> I mean, could they give a... I think to some degree, in most cases they care. They certainly talk about caring. But in, especially in when their, as it gets close to an election. In their mindset, though, it's 
well, we're going to throw $50 million here. We're going to throw a billion dollars. We're going to throw, and that shows that we care, as opposed to thinking through that, how does that really affect people? How does this policy affect people? How, and it's, they're so disconnected, um, particularly on a, on, a, on a bureaucratic side. And, you know, the, the elected folks, unfortunately, our politics have gotten down to the point where as long as I make them hate you more than they dislike me, they'll vote for me. You're trying to make them hate me more than they dislike you. And it's not talking about, well, I did this, I'm for this, I stand up for, for these issues. It's, it's just a personal attacks. And um, unfortunately, that's what voters are falling for. Uh, and so people will continue to do it. Has there ever been any discussion discussion about allowing illegals in here and even amnesty of not allowing them to vote and taking taking the politics out of it. I think that simplified a lot between Republicans and Democrats if they weren't allowed to vote and they could care less. They want a job. Farmers want workers. I think set up a program but don't allow them to vote. The, the category of amnesty or the, the using the term amnesties created such a problem because that was the pitch back in the 80s of let's provide the amnesty program with the intention of putting border security afterwards. And so I, I think probably what we can get past is not necessarily amnesty, but using legal residency status, particularly starting with the, the DACA folks, because that's the one that's out there right now is that they didn't make the conscious decision to break the law. It was their parents that made the conscious decision to break the law. And there's, you know, not knowing whether they came as a two-month-old or as a 16-year-old. I mean, they still came under the category of, of uh, minor children uh, for their parents who were bring them in. Um, so I, that's why I like the, the category of let's put them Give them legal residency that's automatically renewable every three years, provided they don't get involved in criminal activity. It addresses the certainty that they didn't have a status. Uh, they can come out of the shadows. They can they can apply for all the the driver's license and going to school, going you know all of those those categories, and and um, uh, and then going applying for citizenship is fine. Going through the normal route and. Um, so that, that's why I think that's a workable solution. It's a matter of how do we how do we work through that process. I just think the Democrats and Republicans could reach an agreement a lot more if they weren't worried about who, who they were going to vote for. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, the Democrats want to be citizens. I know. And you know, part of that problem, I mean, more and more I see this, is that it's almost having a two-year term in the House is such a bad dynamic because you only get six months in in the odd number of years, and then you're starting to say, okay, how do I position somebody so they have to vote this fall on this bill so that we can talk about it for the next year? And, you know, now we're not even going to have sessions every day in October, you know, for three weeks of sessions in the wood. You're always running for office. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not running, you're wanting to make sure that you've positioned yourself well or was it somebody else bad? <clears throat>
uh, estes.house.gov and uh, sign up if you're interested in for that. And um, that's not the campaign piece. So if you want to do the campaign piece, you can do that on the other side. But uh, um, can I have cards? If anyone wants to get a hold of our office, to, we're happy to be helpful with any federal agency anytime. I'd love to make those calls. <laughs> 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 Of course, I mean, I wasn't expecting that everyone had the time to, but you're welcome to. Um, yeah, you're welcome to. We're just going to do a quick um, sneak peek at the grocery store.